Welcome to a Digital Dairy Sunday School. We're starting a new series aside, looking at them in a larger context, both biblical context, a world context, different ways of seeing the bigger picture of these biblical stories. Now, I remember the first sermon I ever gave, like it was yesterday. It's one of the most vivid memories I have. I was in high school, and I volunteered to give the talk at youth group. Now, it may not have been on a Sunday in a sanctuary, but it was a sermon. I was able to talk about the Bible and what I discovered there, or perhaps better stated, what was revealed to me there through prayer, study, and experience. It truly felt like it was the first day of the rest of my life, like my life was beginning all over again, like I was made for this. I realize that may sound dramatic, but that's what happened. The sermon turned out to be the first of many. I would study a passage in the Bible and then prepare a sermon and then give it, and then study another passage in the Bible and then prepare a sermon and then give it. It's what I've been doing for a while now. And I love it now more than ever. I love the craft, the process, the maddening feel that comes when it's close but not quite there yet. I love the hours of study and reflection. I love just seeing it come together. I love it when I'm working on something and suddenly I see what I haven't seen before, a new way of looking at something, this new realization. And I'm sitting there alone at my desk or in my recliner and I just take a deep breath because I'm overwhelmed that whatever it is I've discovered, I get to share that with people. I say all of this because as a preacher, the Bible is where you start. And the Bible, as we all know, can be a problem sometimes. Some people are against it but don't have any idea what's in it. Some people simply don't trust it. Some see it as an obstacle to evolution and enlightenment, and others just keep repeating the same verses they've been repeating for years, wondering why everyone, including them, is so bored, and others try to find whatever they can in there to justify their preconceived, already held beliefs to beat people over the head with it. And then some have so much baggage associated with the Bible that they don't even know where to start and they don't want to. You see, I find the Bible more fascinating the more I dig into it. And I know it's been used as a weapon. I know it's been used for all kinds of different purposes. But it's so complex and rich. I love this book of books. As I thought through my years of preaching, I've realized that there are a number of insights that have shaped how I approach the Bible. Insights that I, I want to kind of share as we look at some biblical passages together. So if you're burned out, turned off, or buried in the baggage when it comes to the Bible, or you're just curious, you want to know more, you want to be as fascinated with this book as you can, well, I'll invite you to come along. First thing you have to do, though, is start with what you have. The Bible is a series of writings from actual people who lived in actual places and actual times. That's what we have. That's what the Bible is before anything else. That's where we start. It's a book written by people, divinely inspired people, people who had experiences they wanted to share, but it comes from the humanness. We often sometimes want to say the Bible is this completely divine book, and that's more the Quran than the Bible. The Quran has this idea of it is the exact word from God handed down. That's not what the Bible ever claims to be. It's written by people who are inspired, who have experiences of the divine. It's a word of God that points to the word of God, Jesus Christ. The Bible is not the primary revelation of God. Jesus Christ is. I remember hearing that for the first time my a sophomore year of college, just being blown away because I always thought the Bible, well, that's the revelation of God. But no, it's Jesus is the primary word of God. The Bible is the word of God written through human lens. We have to start with that. These people who wrote things were self-centered and funny and greedy and loving and unpredictable and generous and passionate and prone to do really, really stupid things. Like us. They had experiences. They told stories. They did their best to share those stories and put language to those experiences. So when you approach the Bible, you have to start with what you do have, what you do know about it, what it actually is. So we start with what you have, this strange book of books written by people who've had experiences with the divine. They are trying to share 
because they have a sense that this is important stuff. They have received a word of God, an experience of God that they need to share. Second, the more assumptions you drag to the Bible, the less interesting you're going to find it. So let's start with an exercise. Uh, Rob Bell does this in his book, What is the Bible? So you have thoughts about God and the Bible, beliefs, skepticisms, convictions, anger, experiences, things people have told you, things you've read, opinions about God you do or don't believe in, whatever else. Imagine all of these thoughts are marbles, each one a shiny little ball. Got it? Good. Now take all those marbles and put them in your pocket or in a bucket or in the cup holder in your car that's never quite big enough for the extra large drink. You get the point. Set those marbles aside. Put them out of sight. Lose your marbles for a bit. Take all these assumptions, these things you think you know about the Bible, the feelings, everything, and put them aside. Now read the Bible without any of those marbles, without all the assumptions. Go ahead, try it. Pick a random passage. Just jump in. Do your best to read it without any ideas about God entering the picture. If you do this, all you have is the words on the page, written by people, passed down by people, edited by people, decided on by people. That's what you have. And then you can move from there to learn more about the history of interpretation, but start with the words on the page and build out. So let's turn to some of those questions that often come up when people talk about the Bible. Before we try to jump into passages, let's acknowledge some of the questions that people have that maybe keep them from reading the Bible. Let's focus on some of the most common, almost cliche questions like, why did God tell all those people to kill those other people? Well, hopefully you paid attention to Digital Dairy Sunday School in the spring where we talked about that. And if you haven't, go back and look for it. It's on the YouTube. But that's a common thing. Well, why does God promote genocide or ask people to kill all these other people? Or, why would God create people if God knew they would just screw things up? Or, why did Jesus have to die? Couldn't have God have saved the world in some other way? Or, if Cain and Abel were the children of the only humans, Adam and Eve, where did those wives come from? There's all kinds of stories and all kinds of questions. Why are there two creation stories that basically say opposite things? How can they both be true? You've heard some of these, right? Here's why I bring them up. If you were to ask the person asking the question where they got their ideas about this being named God, they have questions about, they would most likely reply, from the Bible. Do you see why this can be a problem? The person asking the questions like these already has a number of assumptions and beliefs and thoughts about God and the Bible that they bring to the reading of the Bible. Most people have thoughts about the Bible like, it says God helps those that help themselves, or God won't give you more than you can handle, or, you know, uh, everything happens for a reason. People come to the Bible thinking that's what God says. Well, that may not always be the case, but then they go looking for it. They read things through that lens. So while they're reading it, they're constantly comparing what they're reading to what they've already decided about who God is and what God is like. It's, it's kind of called a hermeneutic the interpretive lens through which we read the Bible. Everyone has one. But the more of these assumptions we have bringing to the Bible, more lens and filters are going to read through it. So we're only going to find what we want to find. It's basically confirmation bias reading through the Bible. Now this is especially true of religious folk who grew up hearing about a particular version of God. It can be very, very difficult to hear the Bible in any other way. When you grew up hearing it one way, hearing God presented in one uh, form, one kind of uh, personality. If you read the Bible thinking it always says this, it's hard to suddenly realize, well, maybe it never actually said that in the first place. I've had that happen to me. I, I went to seminary and realized, whoa, wait a minute here. This is not what I thought it was. And I could have rebelled against that, held on to what I'd always been taught, or say, you know what? I'm going to put aside the assumptions and come to the Bible fresh, with brand new eyes and ears to hear. The art, the challenge, the invitation then in reading the Bible is to be aware as you can of your marbles and keep them in the drawer as long as you can. Again, the fancy theological word for these marbles is hermeneutic. 
This is often why people who grew up in church go away to college, take a class in literature or comparative religions, and have to read the Bible as part of their coursework and suddenly find it fascinating. Their upbringing actually inoculated them against the compelling nature of the Bible because it spent too much time telling them what it is, taking away all the mystery of it. If you're really interested in this, there's a, there's a, a book by Rachel Held Evans. She passed away just a couple years ago. Uh, she was grew up in this evangelical faith tradition and then kind of found the Bible again for the first time. And she wrote a book called Inspired. Uh, about the Bible, called Inspired, slaying the giants, walking with dragons, all these things the Bible has that sometimes we don't even see because we've thought the Bible is a road map for life. The Bible is God's guide for how to live. The Bible is the rule book. The Bible is how to eat effectively and have a diet. The Bible has been used for everything. We come to the book thinking it is a certain thing, and we miss sometimes how wondrous, strange, exciting crazy, powerful, revolutionary, it really is. Because some of the stuff we look back on and think, wow, this is archaic, at the time was brand new, revolutionary thinking, and we miss that now. Another thing I want you to remember is, it's important to remember the Bible is not an argument. It is a record of human experience. The point is not to prove that it's the Word of God or it's inspired or it's whatever it is the current word people are using. The point is to enter into its stories with such intention and vitality that what you find there is what inspired these people to write down these stories in the first place, what inspired people to keep telling them for generation after generation, for hundreds of years. There's a reason why this story was written down, preserved, and told again and again and again, even before it became the Bible. So when you find something inspiring, the last thing on your mind is proving that it's inspired. You're too caught up in actually being inspired. So stop trying to prove the Bible something. Let it be what it is and let it inspire you. Hence the title of Rachel Held Evans' book, Inspired. Really, go and read it. So if you're trying to prove what it is, you've already, you're already lost in the deep weeds. But if you go deep into the humanity of it, that's, that's when things get interesting. So you have to let it be what it is. Acknowledge your assumptions and put them aside. So there are lots of passages in the Bible that are quite mysterious. Words in the original language we don't have adequate modern equivalents for. Stories that involve practices and rituals we don't have any context for. But if you keep your marbles in your bucket, if you acknowledge your assumptions, and you read and listen carefully, you start to see the story behind the story. The story about people waking up to bigger and more expansive understandings of who they understand God is and what they believe God is actually up to in the world. Your questions then start to take on a new character because you begin to realize that the more you enter into the humanity of their story, the more you discover that there's something at work, something insistent, something enduring, something that won't let these people go, something that inspired them. And then you realize that that same force, presence, pull, and call is at work today within you, in your life, and those around you. And whatever it is that won't let those people go, won't let you go. So whatever your perspectives on the Bible is, let it be what it is. Don't prop it up greater than it is. Don't reduce it to less than it is. If you're still holding on to baggage that you don't need to be holding on to, let it go. If you can't read it without rushing to judgment, put some more marbles in the drawer. Acknowledge the assumptions. If you're only able to read it one way, ask for new eyes. That's sometimes what I do is I read commentaries from a completely different point of view. I read books from... Uh, liberation theology, womanist theology, uh, Catholic theology, uh, Presbyterian theology, um, black theology, all these different things, because they're going to look at the Bible in new ways. It gives me new eyes instead of just getting stuck in my own, always reading it the same way, stuckness. So next week, I want to look at how we can read the Bible from kind of a higher vantage point. We've acknowledged our assumptions. Now, Instead of just seeing one little verse, taking it out of context and saying, See, the Bible says this. I want to go 20,000 feet up 
see the Bible as a whole, see these stories within the larger stories. And then we're going to start having some fun looking at some stories in some brand new ways. So I hope you will join me next week.